Galatians chapter 3. And we'll look at verse number 13. Galatians 3, verse number 13. Scripture says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Well, it's December, and someone was asking me if I was going to bring a Christmas message, so here it is. I'm going to talk to you this morning about a tree that you don't have to decorate. A tree that you don't have to decorate. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you, and our prayer is, Jesus, keep us near the cross. We thank you for the cross. Lord, I pray that as I teach and as I preach that you will take away all distractions and may we focus on that cross. And Lord, as we, as this Christmas time, we know that you came in a manger and, and you came as a baby. We thank you for that, but you came for the cross. And Lord, we, we pray that, and we thank you that it didn't stop at the cross, but there was a tomb that's now empty and you're risen from that tomb. So thank you for coming. we we'll focus our minds on the cross this morning. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A tree that you don't have to decorate. Although we know that Jesus is the reason for the season and the Christmas holidays, one thing that Christmas, the holidays often involves are Christmas trees. Uh, and we're so concerned about decorating these trees. I'm sure some of you, many of you probably have them in your house. We have them in the church. And, and it's, there's nothing wrong with that because we know who we're celebrating, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things you do with a Christmas tree, as I mentioned, is you decorate it. Uh, well, Christmas in the Carter house, the trees look a little different than maybe some of yours. Uh, we started off with, we used to get the real trees. Now, I didn't chop it down. I went to Walmart and got a real tree. And what we found when we first started doing that, our little firstborn son was a little toddler. And the trees, the, you know, all the pine needles were on the ground and, and you had to water those trees as well. And we found this little guy, Josiah, was eating the pine needles and drinking the tree water. <laughs> and so we had to do, <laughs> Sister Robinson, we had to do away with the real tree. And so we got the artificial. And now Judith wants to get in on the party. And, and, and my wife was so pleased with these bulbs that she got. But Judah accidentally, I think, was knocking them off and breaking them. And so our tree is not as decorated as it normally would be. Uh, but that's fine. We, we still put up a Christmas tree this year. Just minimal decorations. Working, we love our Christmas trees. We love our decorations. We love this time of the year, don't we? Well, there's a different kind of tree that people, the people of God and the church ought to be concerned about. And that is not a Christmas tree though it's certainly connected to Christ. Rather than lights and ornaments to add to its beauty, uh, this tree boasts only bloodstains. And it's the tree of the cross of Jesus. And listen, it needs no decoration to cause it to look any better than it really does when we, with, with eyes of faith, look, uh, with, of faith, look at the cross. Now in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, uh, Paul mentions this tree as a part of a quote from the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, and I'll, we may look at that verse in a moment. But though the Christmas season is meant to celebrate the birth of Jesus, and we certainly want to do that, and I'm going to bring a message next week, the, the Sunday before Christmas, to, to focus more on his birth, we are mindful that his supernatural birth uh, would be nothing to celebrate if it were not for his sacrificial death. We have to think about the cross. Uh, the manger in which he lay as a baby was but the first stop en route to the cross where he hung as the Savior. And so for the young Christians in here, I want you to really understand what the cross is all about. And for those who've been saved for a while and we think we understand it and perhaps we, we do, I still want you to look at the cross and focus on it and just say glory to his name Amen. when we think about the cross of Christ. Let's consider the tree of the cross and why we celebrate it all times, but especially even this time of year. First of all, as we look at this verse, this one verse, Galatians 3.13, we see that the first point is this, there is a penalty associated with this tree. When we look at the cross, we understand that there is a 
there's a penalty associated with this tree. In verse 13, Paul wrote that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now reading that verse, the word that reappears and, and rings throughout this verse is the word curse. Uh, when we think and, and when we hear the word curse, some are tempted to think of a sort of voodoo spell or, or a hex. Some people think that, but the word here does not carry that meaning at all. It speaks rather of a punishment. It speaks of, of judgment that specifically comes from God. That's really what that word cursed means. The cross was a place of punishment and the cross was a place of penalty from God. And so with that in mind, consider with me the curse that is associated with this tree. Uh, the, the, the penalty that is associated with this tree. First of all, notice that this curse was a curse based on the law. When you look at the cross, and you think about the penalty that's associated with this tree, you have to understand that this curse that we talk about was first of all a curse that was based on the law. As I said a moment ago, this verse includes a quote from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 23. And I'll not read that verse, but what the, the author here in Galatians, Paul, is making reference to Deuteronomy 21, 23. And if you look at Galatians 3, 13, notice the last phrase of the verse. It says, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, Paul indicates that by Jesus being hung on a tree, he was subjected to a curse. Our Lord and Savior was. But before we even get to that, before his curse is mentioned, even in this verse, something is said about our curse. There's something that's said about our curse in verse 13. Before the curse of the tree... Uh, there is in this verse the curse of the law is what the scripture calls it. The, the curse of the law. And so the curse of the tree was necessary because of the curse of the law. And I'll try to explain that to you. Uh, the law to which Paul is referring to, as you look at uh, Galatians 3 verse 13, it says, Christ hath redeemed us. Notice this from the curse of the law. And so if you were to look back uh, at verse number 10, uh, in the early part of this chapter, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. This is the curse of the law. God gave his law specifically to his people Israel, but generally to all of us, all mankind. All people are ultimately accountable to God and accountable to his law. Uh, those who do not obey the things that are written in that law are subject to the penalty of that law. In essence, we know this. If you cannot keep the entire law, you're subject to the penalty of that law. And so when we think about it, every one of us in this room, I'm not even going to ask you, have you ever broken one law? Because we, unless you're, you're, you're lying if you say you haven't, so all of us have. All of us are subject to the penalty, to that curse that comes from God, uh, uh, listen, we all deserve to hang on that tree. Yes. But we're all uh, cursed because uh, the scripture tells us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And so, uh, the breaking of God's law is called sin. That's the breaking of God's law. And the penalty for sin, the Bible clearly tells us, is death. What does the Romans say? For the wages of sin is what? Death. Uh, the curse of the law that hangs over the heads of all of humanity is the judgment of God upon sin. And as I said, even if you've broken the law, you said, I've kept the entire law except this one time I, I lost my temper. Well, listen, if you've, if you've uh, failed in one area of the law, you failed in the entirety of the law. And all of us are sinners. And so the curse associated with this tree goes back to the curse demanded by the holy law uh, of a holy God. And so it is a curse based on the law. And because we cannot keep the law, we need someone that can keep it for us. And the only way that we can get out from under the penalty of, of this sin and the curse of the law, we need someone who can ascend and rise above the law, who's perfect. And that's where Jesus comes in. So not only do we think about a curse that's based on the law, but the second thought is we think about the penalty associated with this tree is we think about a, a curse born by the Lord. A curse 
that is born uh, by the Lord. And in my King James Bible that I have up here, one of the uh, superscriptions, it says, Christ has borne our law curse that we might have the faith blessing. In other words, he carried it upon himself. When I say born, he, he took it upon himself. That's what Jesus did for us. Now look again at the truth of this verse. Paul said in, in chapter 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Listen, there was a heavy, uh, there was a hard and, and holy curse uh, of the law that hung over all humanity as a result of our sinfulness. You're a sinner. And so that curse hangs over your head and it hangs over my head. But Paul says that Christ was made a curse for each one of us. Now listen, we are cursed as sinners. And yet Christ was not a sinner. We're the sinners. He's the sinless, yet he was made a curse for us. Uh, no curse hung over Christ because he's God. He's sinless. Yet by hanging on the tree, he became a curse himself. That's what happened at the cross. Now, put it this way, over our heads hung the curse of the law, ready to justly fall upon us. We deserved the penalty that was coming for us. We all deserved it. Uh, we're enemies of God. We didn't seek God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good in us, in and of ourselves. Even your best works, the Bible says, the best 20 seconds of your life are, are as filthy rags, your righteousness. So we deserve the curse of the, of the law. That's separation from Christ eternally. That's... that's uh, life in hell or the lake of fire for all eternity. And that's what we deserve. But then at the cross, Jesus hung between us and the curse is what took place on the cross, becoming a, a curse for us. And he took upon himself the full force of the judgment that belonged to you and that belonged to me. That's what Jesus did at Calvary. Amen. Oh, listen, I heard a sad but heroic story that I'll try to use to illustrate what Jesus did for us. And it doesn't even compare. But it's the story of a man during a violent tornado. And this is a true story. Not the tornadoes that just took place, but this is an article that I found, I believe it was in Alabama, within the last five years. And this violent tornado destroyed this man's, his family's home. And one of his children said that his dad ended up on top of him as the house came crumbling down. And he said when the house began to crumble around them, he heard his dad breathe his last breath while praying for his family. Uh, and, and listen, while he was breathing his last breath, the house crumbling down, death is, is imminent. And, and, and daddy is uh, really laying on top of his son and he's praying for his son, his body covering his son. And the father died, but his son's life was spared. Now listen, on the cross, Jesus hung between us and that curse that threatened to, to doom us and to damn us to hell. Jesus hung between us. In essence, he laid over us as the curse came and the curse came on him. And yet on the cross, his final words, his final breath, we could hear him praying for us, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As his body laid over ours and the curse and the full judgment of God, the wrath of God, rather than being poured on you and me, which we deserve, it was poured on his darling son. And rather than the father uh, sparing our lives, sparing the life of the son as in this tornado, the son of God spared the life for all mankind that put their faith in him. In his own body covering us. On the cross, I said it, Jesus hung between us and the curse that threatened to fall upon us. And, and as if you've already said, thank you, Jesus, for taking our place. He died covering our sins with his blood and praying for us. He said, Father, forgive them. You put your name. Father, forgive Jeff Carter. He didn't know what, he done, what he's doing. But I love him. Father, forgive her. Father, forgive him. He, he did it for you at Calvary. And, and, and listen, may we never... Uh, grow complacent to the thought of the cross. May it never grow old and say, I come to church and you're preaching about the cross. Oh, listen, that ought to stir our hearts when we hear about the cross Amen. and the blood of Jesus. Oh, listen, he fulfilled the law. And so he could take the curse. The song we used to sing, he took my sins and my sorrow. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary. He suffered and died alone. There's a curse associated with the tree of the cross. And it's a curse that belonged to us, but we uh, thank God that he was the one that bore 
that curse for us. And so when we think about this tree, we not only see that there is a penalty associated with this tree, but secondly, we see that there is a purchase that is accomplished on this tree. There's a purchase that is accomplished on this, on, on this tree. Three times in this verse, verse 13, uh, we find reference to the curse. And yet, you would look at this verse and think that the verse is, is, is all about the curse. But it's really not about the curse. It's not really uh, the, the main focal point of this verse. It's not about damnation and punishment, although that is a part of it. But the real subject of this verse is found in the word redeemed. Amen. Redeemed. Paul said, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Now listen, there are few words in Christianity, in, in the Christian vocabulary, whatever you want to call it, uh, that are as powerful and wonderful as the word redeemed. That's a wonderful word. Uh, and though we don't use it as much these days, I, I, we don't say, use that word as, as often as probably we should and as often as they have in times past. It ought to be one of the church's favorite words. Redeemed. Redeemed. There was a lady, a blind lady by the name of Fanny Crosby who penned these words that we sing. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child, and forever I am. Now, what's the big deal about that word redeemed? About redemption is what we call it. Well, consider with me this purchase of our redemption that took place at the cross, that was accomplished on that tree, and consider a couple of things. First of all, I want you to think about the concept that is revealed in our redemption. There's a truth that is revealed in our redemption. Now, notice the word redeemed in this verse. The word translated redeem in this verse is not a uniquely Christian word. It's not something that the Christians made up. Uh, but rather, uh, it, is, it appears that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, the New Testament writers adopted this word from their culture, from their society, because of the picture that it paints. The word translated redeem literally means to buy out of the marketplace. That's the base definition, to buy out of the marketplace. It, listen, it describes the act of someone paying the price, uh, paying the ransom to purchase, listen to this, a slave off the auction block. That's what redeem means. Now think about that. Think about the picture that's being painted. People like you and me, all of us, we were born into sin. And you know what we were? We were slaves to sin and Satan. We were literal slaves uh, to our sinfulness. Uh, listen, we were held under its control. We were bound by its chains. Uh, but the gospel proclaims that, that Christ has come to pay the necessary price to redeem those people, to literally buy them out of the slave market of sin. Where we no longer have to be slaves, held captive by our sin, by the power of sin, by the presence of sin, and by the penalty of sin. The only way we could uh, get out of that situation is for Christ to buy us back, to redeem us, to purchase us from that slave market. Now, to a shame, America both promoted and tolerated slavery for over a hundred years of its existence. That's the honest truth. On January 1st of 1863, using an executive order, uh, President Abraham Lincoln issued the now famous Emancipation Proclamation. And I appreciate that, but the document, it declared the immediate freedom of some 3.1 million uh, slaves. Now, while the proclamation declared those people to be free, and I'm thankful for that, although we know that there were many that were not free for quite some time after that. And that's the problem with the, the proclamation. It was uh, not, by definition, it was not an act of redemption, that proclamation. Uh, because no price was paid for the freedom and the liberation of those slaves. They were declared to be free. Oh, but listen, but their freedom was only by decree and not by deed is what took place. Now, the tree upon which Jesus died not only proclaims us to be free. It doesn't just say that we're free, but it is the receipt for the purchase of that freedom as well. And listen, he bought me by his redeeming blood. His blood shows, listen, you are free. I'm not just claiming that you're free, but I paid for it, and I'll show you the receipt with my blood. And it frees all sinners from the bondage of sin. And so as we consider this purchase that was accomplished on this tree, notice with me not only the concept that is revealed in our redemption, we're, old, we're slaves that have been, if you put your faith in Christ, he's purchased us from that slave market. Sin is no longer our master. Uh, Satan is no longer uh, the one that rules over us, but now Jesus is our master. But then 
notice further, the claim resulting from our redemption. The claim resulting from our redemption. When we look at the word redeem, in this verse, we need to consider not only the picture that it paints for us, we've been uh, purchased from the slave market, but we need to also consider the implication of that, per of that purchase. The, what are the results of that, the purchase when Jesus redeemed us? Redemption means not only that we have been bought out of slavery, and I said that's what it means, but it doesn't just mean that. It also means that we have been bought by and for the Savior. Uh, you have to understand this. We've, not only have we been bought out of slavery, but we've been bought by and for the Savior. Because of the price that he has paid for us, the Lord Jesus now has a claim upon each one of us. Uh, listen, uh, we, but we now belong to him. He, he owns us. And, and so let me give you a couple verses that just drive in this truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. The scripture says, it's on the screen, for ye are bought with a price. Well, how were we bought? With the blood of Jesus Christ. And so because he owns us, listen, listen to my words, Jesus owns you. Uh, he is your, you're a slave to something. And some people get bothered by that. I'm, but listen, you're either a slave to your sins or you're a slave to Jesus. But all of us are a slave to something in here. And so Jesus, if you know him, he's bought you. And now you are his servant. He's your Lord. And the Bible says, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. And so he owns you now. I like how Romans chapter 6 verse 18 puts it. It puts it another way. It says, being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. Yeah. You're free from sin. Now you're the servant. If you're saved now, now you're the servant of righteousness. Listen, redemption brings with it a relationship, but it also brings with it a responsibility. The cross is not only the receipt for the price that has been paid. It is the reason that we now serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus did not lay down his life on the cross. He did not suffer. He did not go through all of that, being the, the, the God turning his back on him and being separated from his father and carrying the sins of each of us, all of the, the, the gross and, and, and wicked things that we, we placed on him. He didn't do all of that for us to live any way we wanted to live. Right. No, why? Because not only is he our savior, he's also our Lord. Yes, A lot of times we forget about that part, but listen, he, he's not only pardoned you, but he's also purchased you. Yeah. You belong to him. Yeah. And so uh, he, he's purchased. And now listen, we need to know, I love the word redeemed, but we need to understand more than just words and say the words. In other words, a lot of us, we, we know the church words. We can talk about being redeemed, but listen, we need to know the meaning of it. But we also need to know the living of it as well. Yeah. And so to be redeemed, I'm saying it again, you've been pardoned, but you've also been purchased. Yeah. And so we can use churchy words like redeem, but the result of it ought to be seen in our life. Lord, I belong to you. Thank you for pardoning my sin. Thanks for forgiving me of my sins. But too many people leave it at that. He forgave me. Now I can do whatever I want. But that's not true salvation. He forgave me, and now I'm free to serve him. That's, how, that's what redeem means. He, he got you out of the slave market, but now you belong to him. And I say thank you, Lord, because... I remember when I was a slave to sin. And some of you remember being a slave to alcohol and being a slave to your lust and being a slave to your anger and being a slave to even your religion. But when Jesus redeemed you and set you free, you found true freedom in Christ. Yes. That's because of the cross. So if you're truly saved, you belong to him. Once sin owned us, but now he owns us. And listen, if you really know him, you understand that he's a good, he's a good master. Yes. Oh, listen, you can love and obey him. I can illustrate it like this. I'm talking about slavery, not just in America, but throughout all of history. And this is just an illustration, so just follow me here. This is how we ought to act with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Imagine being a slave and, and you have an evil master. And, and you just, I, I won't even go into the details. You, you all know how it is. You've been you're mistreated, abused. But then one day... A good person comes, a good man, a, a good master comes and purchases you, purchases you from that master. And he takes you into his own home and he doesn't treat you like a slave, but he treats you like a son. He treats you like a daughter. And he feeds you, he takes care of you. He doesn't rip your children away from you and sell them to someone else. He doesn't abuse you and beat you and misuse you, but he loves you. You're a part of his family. Listen, you would be a fool if you wouldn't say, I love you and I'll live with you and for you. Because the only other option is to go back to the old, wicked, evil slave master. And as a Christian, you'd be a fool to say, listen, he saved me, but I don't want to live for him. And that's what you're saying, I want to be a slave to Satan. 
And that'll wreck your life and ruin your life. You Listen, I'm saying it. You'd be a fool not to say, Lord, I love you. You rescued me. You saved me. And you gave me your life. And you deserve my life. Yeah. Think about that word redeemed. That ought to make you say, Lord, you deserve everything I have. Yeah. It's not a burden for me to serve you. Yeah. It's not a burden for me to give my time. It's not a burden for me to give my... Because listen, you were doing all that to the world. Yeah. And they used you up. Yeah. And so people have gotten a little church in them. And we can talk the, the, the words. And people talk about I'm sanctified. But in essence, your life is stankified. <laughs> It's more than the word. Know what the word means and live it out. That's the Holy Spirit to help you live it out. Can I get a witness? Amen. You say, I'm saved. You know the words, but you can't even behave. There's something wrong with that. They talk about how they have God, but the question is, do you really belong to Jesus Christ? It's more about knowing the lingo. It's about knowing him. When you understand what he did on the cross, you can do nothing but love him and serve him. So... The word redeemed is more than just Christian terminology. It's a purchase made at the cross that changes who and what we are forever. Oh, listen, Satan once had me so firm in his prison. I'd never get out, so it seemed. And then one day I heard footsteps down the hall of that dungeon and a voice rang out, I've come to redeem. And that was Jesus Christ. He redeemed me. He bought me out of the slave market of sin. So there's a penalty associated with this tree. Secondly, there's a purchase accomplished on this tree. But finally, there's a paradox attached to this tree. A paradox, Brother Hicks. By definition, a paradox is a figure of speech in which a statement appears to be contradictory. That's what a paradox is. Uh, less is more. That's a paradox, that phrase. You say, how is less more? I heard one of the ladies say, save money by spending it. I didn't understand that one. <laughs> and that was not my wife that said that. But here's the paradox in Christianity. You look at the cross, think about what took place on the cross, and we can say the beautiful death of Jesus Christ. His death was beautiful. The glorious, the lovely cross of Calvary. And someone would look at that and say, there's no way, there's, it's not lovely, it's gory. But with eyes of faith, we can say the, the cross was, is, was, is wonderful. It's lovely. So when we consider the tree of the cross, we find in it a paradox of reality and spiritual truth. Now consider the, parado the paradox attached to this tree. For one thing, I want you to think about the cross viewed as a grim place. Perhaps before you were saved. Uh, maybe someone in here now that does not understand the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross. And when you look at it, the, you view the cross as a grim and a gruesome place. Look again at the phrase of our text. Paul said, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. While Jesus hung upon the tree, those who saw him in that day, the Jews, uh, they would have viewed him as an, as an accursed man. Uh, they saw him condemned by their law and, and cursed by their God when they looked at the cross. Uh, nothing good about the cross at all. Uh, there was hardly anything so offensive and repulsive is a word you could use to the Jewish mind, then that tree turned into uh, a Roman execution when they looked at the cross. That's all. This a criminal hanging on a cross, facing a gory, gruesome, uh, hideous death. You know, in many ways, the cross is still a grim and gross and ugly thing to people today. There are people, even in our hymn books, they want to take the, the word blood out of, out of the hymn book. It's a little too much for them. They think about the cross and, and they think how gruesome and how gory it is. And there's got to be a better way and I can work my way into heaven. And they think about death and all of the things that are associated with it. And to our world, in pursuit of its own uh, pleasures and enjoyment, the cross stands like a dark cloud over the parade when they think about the cross. A gold-plated world wants a little to do with a blood-covered tree. And so, to many people, the cross is viewed as a grim place. But if you've ever met Jesus, that's not the case for you. There's the paradox for the, that same blood spattered tree looks very different to others like you and many of, many of us in here. Because consider not only the cross viewed as a grim place, but if you know Jesus, you can say this, the cross viewed as a glorious place. The cross viewed as a glorious place. The very same tree that was so offensive and grim to the Jews and even to the world today. Uh, that tree that designated a curse upon the one that hung upon the tree 
is the very same tree that we as God's people, we now celebrate. We celebrate. We sing songs of Jesus keep me near that cross. We're not running from the cross, but I want to go to the cross and stay at the foot of the cross and stay close to Jesus. Because on that tree and through that Savior that hung on the tree, the curse that belonged to us was taken from us and we were redeemed from its power over us. A little later in this book, the same book, Paul said in chapter 6 of Galatians in verse 14, uh, he said, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, I, uh, it, I'm only going to glory in the cross. And God forbid if I glory in anything else, I want to lift up the cross of Christ. Uh, the tree that is grim to the world is glorious to the children of God. We celebrate the cross. And we glory in the curse-covered, blood-soaked cross, for we know what the blood means to us. We know that the curse has been taken away from us. And so we sing with our hearts the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. And then we say this, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I thank God for the cross this morning. I thank God that we can celebrate Christmas, but it had not been for the cross, Christmas would be worthless. Just a cute little baby born, but listen, he's not a baby anymore. He's a man that died on Calvary's cross and is now risen from the grave. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And we look to the cross to get to him in heaven. We go through the cross. And you must come by the way of the cross. Oh, the paradox attached to this. It's gruesome. It's, it's gory. His mother Mary had to view his, his naked body upon the cross, the nails in his hands and in his feet, the crown of thorns upon his head, the blood. Imagine, Mama, your son on the cross, but yet we, the children of God, say, thank you, Jesus. It's glorious, the cross. It's a beautiful picture, the cross. It's beautiful. Now, I wonder this morning, how do you see it? Have you even thought about the cross on this Christmas holiday, when you look at your Christmas tree, yes, think about the gifts and think about those grandbabies and those children. But when you look at that tree, think about the tree at Golgotha. Golgotha. Think about the cross. It ought to do something for us. The cross will either repel a man or it'll compel a man to come to Jesus. There's no middle ground with the cross, Brother Lewis. It's either going to push people away as they reject Jesus or it's going to compel, repel or it's going to compel you to kneel at the foot of the cross and I'm thankful to say that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That's the paradox. For those of us who see it with eyes of faith, the old rugged tree is the most compelling thing that we've ever seen. Not everybody puts up a Christmas tree during Christmas and that's fine. You don't have to. However, there's one tree that none of us can do without this season and for any season for that matter and that's the cross of Calvary. It's indispensable for us as we come to a close. That cross and what our Lord accomplished there are the, of the utmost value and importance in our life. The curse was lifted at the cross. But as we come to the invitation, let me ask you a question. Have you looked to the cross? Listen, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your savior? You can celebrate Christmas all you want, but if you don't know Christ, it doesn't mean anything. Do you know Jesus this morning? Simply have you repented of your sins and believed in Jesus Christ? What he did on the cross raising from the grave and understanding, listen, he took the curse. He forgives me of my sins and gives me a new life if I just believe in him as I follow him. But then here's the second thing. Are you living out the cross? He, he's redeemed you. And that means this. He's not just your savior. He's your Lord. He didn't just uh, pardon you. He's purchased you. You belong to him. So Christian, are you living for him this morning? As we think about the manger, let your eyes gaze upon the cross. Has it had that effect in your life? Let's not be a people that know the words, but not walking the walk. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads and close your eyes. If God has spoken to you this morning.